Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Shots Fired podcast. We are super excited to introduce our next guest with you. Uh, she's a licensed uh, marriage and family therapist. She is certified in EMDR, trained in brain spotting, certified in critical incident stress debriefs, and she's attended the California State University of Sacramento. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in Criminal Justice. She attended the University of San Francisco, where she received her master's in psychology, and her credentials make us look really bad, but <laughs> we'd like to welcome to the show Melissa Freitas, uh, EMDR uh, post-trauma therapist. So, Melissa, thanks for coming on to the show with us. We are super excited to have you on. Yeah, very excited. And I know everybody excited that's listening. Here, guys. Yeah, everybody that's listening in on this, I know, is um, excited to hear what you have to offer and really what EMDR therapy is and post-trauma therapy. Um, so we'll get in, in a little bit later about how I met you and, and get into that. But uh, do you want to go and introduce yourself a little bit and um, how you got into doing what you're doing with post-trauma therapy? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I started my journey thinking out, I um, actually wanted to be in law enforcement. So I started at Sac State in the criminal justice program and got hired in Placerville to work in the jail um, and then got there and realized this was not the avenue I wanted to help with. And so instead, I decided to kind of go from there. And I started working at a group home with sex offenders um, and doing psychology with them. Nice. And it was kind of my interest in mixing both worlds of law enforcement and really liking that um, with my love for psychology. And then I went and got my master's at University of San Francisco. And then from there, um, started kind of seeing clients and really found that working with first responders was kind of a culture that I already knew from being married to law enforcement. Um, but also it just kind of fit my personality, my style. And then from there, I just started picking up more and more first responders and then kind of curtailed all the training I was doing to benefit them. Awesome. So what, um, you said you wanted to get into law enforcement. I mean, I did. um, why? Yeah. <laughs> how, how, like what, like what drove you down that Avenue to like, why, why did you want to get into law enforcement? Just, was it family or just because? Um, so Go just ahead. growing up in the Bay, growing up in the Bay area, um, just totally seeing people in poverty and the way that my community was. Um, I wanted to get into law enforcement and make a difference and give back. And I think um, I came to that epiphany a little bit sooner than other people that that's really a difficult thing to do in law enforcement. <laughs> yeah. um, and I might be able to change a little bit more if I went um, the psychology side of it and started to help people before they were interacting with law enforcement. Uh, yeah. But I, what I found was I ended up liking to help law enforcement more than those people. <laughs> Because we need the most help, probably. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> All first responders do. Um, yeah, so I'll get into kind of how we met. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so how I met Melissa, um, I've talked about in previous episodes, um, is, um, and you guys know through, if you follow me in the class that I do, is it's, it started out with, um, you know, I was having some, you know, post-trauma issues and symptoms of it, and um, I was about, I don't know, 10 years into my career when I started experiencing these. I'd been involved in a few officer-involved shootings, um, plus some other critical incidences. And I was really starting to notice things about myself that I was changing for the worst. And luckily for me, I, I recognized it before I started going down a rabbit hole uh, that I probably wouldn't have been able to come out of, uh, that a lot of guys or, or gals experience. So once I started experiencing, experiencing that, um, you know, I was having severe anxiety at work. There were, if I would get dispatched to a call, um, not even something, you know, create that we would consider crazy or high risk or anything. I would notice like my heart rate would just jump. Um, just being dispatched to something, my, my, I would just felt like I was getting anxiety. My palms would get sweaty. And, uh, a part of me, um, was like, I didn't want to have to go to what I was you know, getting dispatched to or whatever, but I knew like that was my job and I had to do it. And being in the position I was in as a dog handler, you know, that was obviously expected of me to go to a lot of critical incidences. So, yeah, I mean, dog handlers are usually going to the, the most extreme calls too. So, yeah, that's like, that's what, that's what we do. So I, and I never told anybody that I was having these experiences and, and I don't think 
a lot of people ask me, was it um, one particular incident? And for me, and I can't talk for everybody, but for me, it was not one thing. It was, I think it was several different things over a period of time. And, and a lot of those incidences were within a close uh, proximity of time um, when they happened with each other. So I think within like three years, um, I had been in three shootings plus a bunch of other stuff. So uh, all of that, uh, I think, had just um, caused me to have all these issues. And I was like, what? I didn't really know what was wrong with me because in law enforcement, and you can contest to this, Billy, is um, we are not, nobody ever talked about post-trauma. Nobody talked about post-trauma therapy, symptoms of it. It was always just, I don't think, you know, we were always taught, like, you don't really talk about that. You well, just... I also think that even if you do talk about it and you do recognize some of the things, you're just, you're so indoctrined to just be like, ah, just I, get have over a, it. I have a little bit of it or it's whatever. And I, I will, you know, I'll deal with it. Yeah. And, and so I was having those issues and, and it was starting to uh, transition into my home life. And I did not like who I was becoming. And I felt like I was pretty respected at my job. And then I started noticing people that respected me were distancing themselves from me because I was now becoming that guy. And so, um, you know, for me, I decided to, I can vividly remember actually how it happened was I was getting ready for work one day and I started, um, I started feeling that like anxiety, putting my pants on for work. And, and I, what, for whatever reason that day, I just said, I'm not doing this anymore. And so you did not wear pants that day. I, I did wear pants, but it wasn't my work pants. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. I just want so, to clarify that yeah. some people are like, I put different, oh, hey, he went pants. I put different pants on. Um, <laughs> yeah. And as a dog handler, you know, we put our, we change into our uniforms at home and have a take home car. Right. So like I was getting my uniform on and I started feeling like that. And I'm like, I'm like, fuck this. I'm done. I'm done feeling like this. I just, I, I did not feel like I wanted to continue doing the job anymore. Um, and so that day I was like, I'm, I'm done. I called my boss. I said, I'm not coming into work today and I'm having some issues. And honestly, his reaction was like, uh, I think he was basically like, well, I'm, we're actually kind of shocked. It took you this long to come <laughs> like, out no, and say no anything. shit. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so, uh, he was really cool about it. I, I didn't really know how they were going to take it. Um, I had never heard of any other officer that I worked with that went out on like a, I guess a PTSD claim or, uh, post-trauma claim or anything like that. And so, um, yeah, anyways, long story short, he met me in a parking lot. We obviously did some paperwork with each other and, and I was off after that. And, and then it kind of became now what I, I had no idea what direction to go. I didn't know who to contact. Um, I obviously went through my work, you know, workman's comp. They set me up with this, uh, a therapist and, um, I went and saw him actually, I did a couple of visits with him and as I'm describing to him, like my symptoms, he, he pretty much stops me and he's like, Hey, I'm not a, I'm not a post-trauma therapist and not all therapists, uh, offer the same services. And he's like, you need to go talk to a post-trauma therapist. And I'm like, well, shit, like, that's what I thought we were doing. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, no, I really, yeah. I thought like, I, yeah, I thought that, that that's what I was talking to him for. So, um, I didn't get a whole lot of guidance from him on, he didn't mention to me anything about EMDR therapy. I didn't know anything about it at still at the time. And, uh, so from there, I mean, I'm off of work. It's been like three or four weeks now. I haven't talked to anybody. I'm wanting to better myself. And so I started doing research on my own and that's how I stumbled across EMDR therapy. And oddly enough, a, f a couple years prior to me reaching out to you, Melissa, a sergeant of mine, who lateral to our agency from a much bigger agency had sent us an email um, with some contact information for therapy for therapists, you know, should we ever need it. And I remembered that. And so I went back and I scrolled through my emails and I'm not kidding. It was like two years old. And that's how I found your number that he had sent. And I'm like, well, I'm, I mean, I don't know where else to go. So I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to reach out to you. <clears throat> and that's when I think I texted you or I called you and, kind of told you what I was experiencing and you were like, Oh, I, I, I can absolutely fix you. Um, I know exactly what you're, you're talking about. Scheduled an appointment with me. I went and I met with you. You told me what EMDR therapy was and you were like, 
um, I can fix your symptoms. And at first I was kind of leery, like, eh, I don't know, you know. Because um, you're a cop. And well, you're just like, eh. yeah, I'm a cop. And I'm always also, like, yeah, we're on the defensive. Yeah. And, you know, I'm a c- I'm not a guy that uh, I don't wear my emotions on my sleeve. I don't, I don't talk to people about it. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think during this time we were friends and I, yeah, I didn't, I, I didn't tell I, anybody. I, didn't know, I was like, Oh, Kyle's just off work. Cause yeah. I never told anybody at work. Do. I didn't talk, talk to any other officers. I didn't talk to my friends about it. Um, people picked up on it, obviously because my attitude changed and stuff, but I kind of played it off. But, um, Anyways, I just remember sitting in your office and you're describing to me what EMDR therapy was. And I, and I was a little leery about it. And I remember you telling me like, hey, I need you to buy into it. Believe what I'm telling you. Go through the process. And at the end of it, I promise you, you will be a different person. And by God, at the end of it, I think we did a total of 16 sessions or I did 16 sessions with you. Um, it, it really did change me. It changed my whole outlook on the profession, myself, and yeah, I mean that that's how yeah. I met you. Um right. so is it is it so when it comes to I haven't done any therapy. God knows I probably need plenty of it. But um it, it's it's common to not find someone that you match with right away, right? That that's that's very from what I've heard from people is you know, hey, go talk to some people and if you don't like it, it's not the end of the world. It's not like it's not for you. You just don't connect with that person and you can move on to someone else. Yeah, absolutely. I like to tell people when they come into my office, think about therapy like Costco. You sample a lot of stuff there, but you don't buy everything unless you love it. Yeah. Um, And if you think about therapy like that, go sample out the therapist, go try them out, go see who's the best fit for you. Because we actually know that the degree to which you get better is directly related to your relationship with your therapist. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and like you said, Kyle, when you come in, if you don't have a relationship with somebody where you trust them, you're not going to buy in. You're yeah. not going to want to do the work. When they tell you to do something, you're kind of hesitant. But if you really click with your therapist, you feel safe, you feel connected, you feel like, okay, this is my person, your work will show it. And so don't, it doesn't offend us in the therapeutic community because we know that, that that's what people should be doing. And when they tell us that off the bat, we're like, yeah, come in, check us out. Yeah. And it's funny you said that because it reminds me of a story of, of, a, of an officer that worked at a different agency. And, and I told him about EMDR therapy and he went out and sought out his own therapist that specialized in it. And he called me and he, I think he had done like a few sessions and he was like, Hey, this isn't really working for me. I'm not clicking with my therapist. Like the things he's telling me, I'm not, I'm, we're not jiving with each other. And I'm like, dude, I'm like, you need to, you need to get rid of them and go find, you need to find a therapist that you connect with. Because like what you just said, if you're not connecting with, the therapist to me, it's, it's pointless because you're, yeah, like you said, you're not going to want to put in the work. You're not buying into what they're telling you. And it's almost like it, to me, it's a waste. It's a total waste of time. Well, and, and I think in law enforcement, first responders, we're, we're, we're closed off people for the most yeah. part. And we don't like, we, I, I know Kyle doesn't like talking about his emotions. I know I don't like talking about my emotions. And it's, if you don't trust that person that you're talking about your emotions to, then it's just not going to work. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, you I, know, go ahead. You know, I'm going to add to that too, that there's also going out and finding an EMDR therapist and there's also going and finding a therapist that's um, culturally competent with working with first responders. Yeah. Um, because you can go find an EMDR therapist and you're going to start talking about a dead baby call and mm-hmm. that therapist is going to be like, time out, time out. I don't want to hear that stuff or yeah. they're yeah. going to get upset. And you got to make sure your therapist can hear what you're really well willing and wanting to share because you guys already have the culture where it's like, uh, I don't want to talk about what happened at work because I don't want to taint somebody or somebody I care about with these stories. Yeah, That cannot come into the therapy room. You have to feel like my therapist can tolerate this. And so finding a therapist that knows your culture, knows your guys' way of speech pattern, talking, um, the things that are important to you, and has an EMDR or brain spotting trauma background so that both of those are going to blend together to make that first responder really feel welcomed in the room. So yeah. real, real quick. I mean, I don't, I don't know if we breezed over it or whatever. Um, I don't know much about EMDR or brain spotting at all. Yeah. Well, I was gonna, can you, can yeah. you explain what EMDR and like, I actually, I know nothing. I've heard about EMDR from uh, Kyle, but brain spotting, I, I don't know the first thing about it. Yeah. Break down okay. for us. What is EMDR and then what is brain spotting and how, 
you know, first responders benefit from that type of therapy versus mm -hmm. other types of therapy that people offer? Mm -hmm. So we'll start with kind of EMDR. So EMDR was developed back in the 90s by Francine Shapiro. Um, and long story short, what she kind of noticed was that when you mix eye movement, so EM, the EMDR, stands for eye movement. That was the first part that was discovered. Um, she found that when you moved your eyes bilaterally, side to side, engaging not only the right and the left hemisphere, um, that it seemed to, for some reason, when you also did that while talking about a memory, it seemed to lower distress. And so the idea grew from there. And EMDR, what it does basically is, just like the letters say, it desensitizes and reprocesses disturbing material. So when we experience something in life that's really disturbing, whether it be um, an OIS or a pediatric call um, or just something really intense, the body can't necessarily process it. Um, I do a lot of different analogies, but my analogy here is like Thanksgiving dinner. Um, it's so big that it sits in you and it takes a long time to process. And sometimes incidents are like that. You heard a lot. You saw a lot. You smelt a lot. Maybe you even taste something and then your body experienced something. That's a lot of material to process. Yeah. And it ends up kind of getting stuck in your brain or your nervous system. And so it cannot move from one side of the hemisphere to the other to process appropriately. Mm. And so what you get left with is this old material or um, memory that's kind of stuck in the brain that continuously pops up and that can pop up in different ways. Um, and so EMDR by going back and thinking about that image, um, and feeling the feelings in your body, and then it usually has a cognition with it. Um, when we think about that old memory, we have a belief about ourselves, um, and we, hold all three of those together. And then the therapist turns on some type of bilateral stimulation. Um, it can be the eye movement that was originally discovered. We later moved to a lot of earphones, hearing beeping in one side and then the other, or vibrating paddles that vibrate back and forth. Um, and what that does is it gets that material that's kind of stuck to move back and forth in the brain, left and right, to um, access different information. And so usually when something is stuck, it doesn't have access to other parts of the brain. So somebody who's involved in a critical incident might think, I'm weak. I didn't do enough. Why didn't I shoot him back? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Why didn't I engage in that pursuit? And so they think about that material and it feels really disturbing to the person. And then, like I said, there's a belief with it, right? I'm not a good cop. I'm weak. Um, and when both of those are there, it's not able to access other information in the brain on maybe a different side of the brain that knows something else. And in EMDR, we call that adaptive information. So that might be, um, I'm smart, I'm capable, I survived, I did the best I could, um, I'm stronger than I thought. And by moving that kind of stuck piece back and forth in the brain, we start adding on adaptive information that by the time you're done with EMDR, when you think about that original material, um, the new belief should be present. So instead of I'm weak, I didn't do enough. It's I did the best I could. I'm a pretty good cop. Um, and then that disturbance is gone. Yeah, that that's, uh, I mean, that's pretty powerful that you say that because I, I mean, I've had my own experiences where, um, you know, I've, I've shared a story about um, early on in my career, I had a guy pull, pull a gun out on me and my partner after threatening to shoot us, he pulled a gun out of his pocket and we didn't shoot him. And right that bothered me for a, for a long time. I thought, I honestly thought that I didn't have, I may not have what it takes to save my own life or my partner's life or somebody else's life because I didn't do what the book says I should have done, which was, you know, to shoot the guy. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, what you just said, I mean that, I, I mean, I have my own examples of, of feeling like that. Um, I think we all, I, I mean, I think that yours are probably more extreme than, than most or some. But I, I think, you know, you brought up as simple as uh, pursuit. Why didn't I get in that pursuit? Why yeah. did I Why did I code for? Or why did I cancel that pursuit? Mm -hmm. You know, wh whatever it is. And you just, at, at the moment, you know, you, you make decisions off of what you know. And it's easy to Monday morning quarterback. Or it's easy to go back and go, oh, well, this, 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 this. And you're like, well, when I made that decision, I didn't, I didn't know all that, right? So I, I think yeah. that that comes up to it, but 
in the end, you do end up learning that and you're like, oh, shit or oh, fuck, whatever it is. Yeah. I mean, but is sometimes there... those don't connect in the brain. Imagine there just being no communication. Yeah. Why didn't I um, go in, get in pursuit? And you know what? I did the best I could with that. What I had at that moment. What happens when there's no pathway that connects that? They both are just individual entities that live in the brain that don't really connect. And then we don't feel that connection. So we have to use EMDR to actually make a connection. We're trying to make a new kind of network or pathway in the brain so that both of those are going to fire at the same time in some sense. So that when you think of that original incident, that new, more adaptive belief about yourself comes up. Hmm, that's interesting. Um, what, I mean, what would you say to a guy that or, or gal that is having that thought because they went through that? at that moment in time. And like you just described, they're not connecting with each other. Are they supposed to just feel like that? Or is there something that they should do to tell themselves that I, I don't know, to make them feel better about themselves, why they didn't engage in whatever it was that they should have engaged in. Because, you know, I'll be honest, I've been in, you know, I've, I've been in a few shootings, you know, that, and everyone that I've been involved in, whether I was directly involved in it, or I was there as a witness to it, every single one I've seen officers where they did not engage and they either, um, you know, went the other way or sought cover and didn't come out from, you know, cover because uh, that's scary. I mean, it's, it's Mm -hmm. fucking scary being involved in that type of situation. And there's no denying that. Um, to me, what I've noticed the most is, is being involved in those types of things. The folks that don't get involved or they don't engage, how they should, they struggle the most over the people that actually were directly involved in those types of incidences. I see it time and time again. Um, they're always the ones that suffer the most and I'm not going to get into Nate. I'm not going to get into, um, specific stories, but, uh, there have been times when that has happened on stuff that I've been involved in. And I've had those officers come to me months later down the road, years later down the road, And they are still feeling it and they will still apologize um, for not engaging. And I think that just lingers with people. Absolutely. The body does not appreciate that. Because when you're in one of those situations that you've just described, your body's in fight or flight, right? Let's do this, baby. Let's go. Let's go. And everything in your body has geared up for fight or flight right? Your heart's pumping, your lungs are going, your pupils are dilated, your body says go. Mm -hmm. But then you don't move. Yeah. That doesn't match. And so what happens is all of that energy that was gearing you up to go do that did not get used. Now Mm -hmm. it's stuck. And that's what we call um, unprocessed kind of trauma or unprocessed traumatic stress. And we know that that's there because it shows up two different ways. First responders come into my office after something like that, stuck on or stuck off. And so sometimes what happens is we have all this undischarged stress and somebody comes into my office, they're agitated, they're irritated, they're anxious, they're hypervigilant. Usually there's some digestive problems and they're really struggling to get their nervous system to turn off. But then sometimes you've been stuck on for so long like any good system that's about to overheat from being on for too long, it shuts itself off. And then a first responder will walk in my office and they're flat. They're depressed. Mm -hmm. Um, They can't get off the couch, right? They're riding the magic chair. Um, They find that they don't want to engage in their kids. And that happens when you're in a situation where you didn't get to respond appropriately. And then of course we assign some belief, like I'm not supposed to be a cop. I'm weak. Um, I suck at this. Instead yeah. of just knowing that there's times where the body is not going to let you respond because of the amount of stress. And it, it wasn't your choice in that moment, whether or not you got to respond, your nervous system is hundreds of millions of years old and made that choice for you. Yeah. It, it's amazing what our bodies do and our brains do and how, what your brain does um, in your nervous system, how they react under such high stress. Yeah. Um, you know, so how dangerous do you think that is? I mean, if, if, a, if an officer or, any first responders feeling like that and they're continuing to go to work every, every single day. Do you, do you think that there's a point where like, let's say something happened to them at work and let's say it's a lethal encounter at some point, do you think that they're able to break through, break through that non-engagement and actually if they did engage, I mean, is that, I I guess I don't know how to ask it um, appropriately, but 
um, is that going to make them feel better about how they were feeling before when they, when they didn't engage? Well, I think that, you know, using that um, unprocessed stress, right, to be able to go and complete the action, it's going to help resolve some of the um, PTSD or PTSI symptoms that that responder is experiencing. Um, And I think that kind of broaches probably a little too quick for our conversation right now is something called (laughs) PTSD resiliency, um, which is if you can learn from that, you can actually become stronger and better the next time it does happen but you have to understand why that's happening, why your body didn't respond before you're going to be able to do something different. Sure. Okay. Um, Well, I I had a question. Um, So, so much of the time we talk about um, acting or, you know, what you did because of it. Um, What, what, how do I ask this question? Cause I get my free therapy, I guess right now. (laughs) (laughs) Um, so, so many times you're in situations and whatever it may be, a uh, fight, shooting, pursuit or whatever, and you do something and it all ends up, it's all within policy. It all ends up great in the end, but you look back on those things and you go, man, if, if I did, you know, if I was an inch to the left, I was an inch to the right, or if I, uh, if I hit that a mile an hour faster or whatever, fucking who knows? I'm, I'm not here. It, you know, someone else isn't here. My partner's not here, whatever. Um, I think those are some of the things that a lot of people that, you you know, the littler things where you're like, ah, but that happens to all of us. Of course it happens to all of us, but it's that cumulative, Hey, that's happened to every street cop. That's probably happened to probably nightly. Um, and you just kind of like, yeah, it worked out. Okay. And you kind of, you move on. Yeah. But did you move on or did you leave part of yourself back in that situation? Because the statement of if I was an inch to the left or an inch to the right, I could have died. Mm -hmm. What that says is that your brain hasn't fully accepted that you survived and lived that there's part of you that in that moment goes, I almost died when I heard that bullet whiz past my head. And that means it's not fully processed in the brain that the brain still is not computing that you did survive, that your coworker is alive. And so we ask questions sometimes in therapy, like, when did you know you survived? Um, And we're trying to get all of the brain to realize that that's over and done um, and that you're here now and safe. But sometimes because it's so traumatic, the brain cannot add that new adaptive information into that critical incident. And that's where you need the EMDR to help those two kind of stick together. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, it fucking blows my mind that we're not taught this either in the academy or you know, why, why don't we have therapists that are, you know, have your particular training embedded within our police departments, fire departments, whatever, you know, it honestly blows my mind that we're not given this information to help better ourselves because the reality is this shit happens so much to over and over and over. Like he said, nightly to some officers. I mean, it depends where you work, but, or or even firefighters. Um, and they, they, like, nobody knows where to go. They don't know why they're feeling this way. And what, like what you're describing makes perfect sense to anybody that's listening. But unless you're told that or taught that, how is anybody, how is anybody ever supposed to know that and, and to help better right. themselves? And, and that, that's what blows my mind is that we uh-huh. do such a shitty job of, yes. of offering this type of services to people that do our job so that, you know, we're not committing suicide because that is the number one year after year. That's the number one cause of um, highest cause of law enforcement death is suicide. And so it, 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 I guess it just, it it fucking blows my mind that I, I don't think it's um, I, I do think that our agencies and whatever they may be, or I, you know, there are options out there and they, they put out to you. Sure. People to the, to the best, of not even to the best of the abilities, but they do put it out there. I think that the bigger problem is the st- the stigma of, you know. Yeah, uh, there's I, that. Of, I don't want to say, I, I don't have a problem. How many people have you said, I mean, how, how often did you say you didn't have a problem? Never, I never did. And so that's the thing. But in going but back to. Before you went and did this, you, you never, you, you didn't, you knew you had a problem immediately. And you just didn't do anything about it? Or did you just sit there and you said, hey, I don't have a problem, I don't have a problem, until it became, you started to realize that it wasn't well, a problem? I wrote it out because it's our culture 
in law enforcement and, that's and what firefighting. I'm, but that's what I'm saying. Yeah. The culture is you don't say anything. And when I felt like that, honestly, I felt like I'm being a, a weak bitch. Like, that's what I thought. Yeah. That's what I was telling myself. And so right. it progressively got worse and worse and worse. Till finally, luckily for me, I, I realized it and I'm, and I saw the path that I was going down and, you know, I've got a family and kids and, and, a, and a wife. And, and so I'm like, I'm not going to let myself do that. So, um, but, but that's me, but not everybody does that. You know, here locally, we right. had a, we had an officer on duty who had a family and a wife shot and killed himself in his patrol car on duty. Right. Um, that's right. I mean, my God, for someone to hit the boiling point like that, it, it, it's, it's sad. Um, and not that our administrators don't want to help us because I know that they do. And they are, put, this is becoming more of a popular topic for, for everybody. Um, I would say probably within the last couple of years, but they don't, they, they're not educated on this either. You know, you ask, go ask your administrator, your chief, your sheriff, a uh, captain, lieutenant, whatever about EMDR therapy. And I, I'm willing to bet you nine out of 10 of them are going to say, I don't, I've never heard of it. So as I guess what I'm trying to say is as a whole, we need to do a better job in our profession and our culture to spread the word about what she's describing and breaking the stigma of not being afraid to open up and saying, Hey, I'm having an issue with whatever call that I went on. And it doesn't have to, and I tell this to everybody, it doesn't have to be a shooting. It could be like what you said, a pediatric call, a, a baby death or a child death. Um, it, doesn't it, need, it doesn't even have to be that. It could be whatever. Right. So, so I, two kind of points to that. One is I agree with you hundred percent, Kyle. In, if you went to work tonight and your gun jammed, you would not slide your gun over to somebody and be like, hey, gun's jammed. How do I fix it? Yeah. That's fucking ridiculous. Yeah. Right. right? So why when your brain jams, do you slide your brain over to me and go, hey, fix it? Shouldn't you have some basic idea and knowledge of how it works so that you can get it unstuck if you need to? Yeah, tools. And it, Tools, right? And an understanding of how this works so that when it doesn't work, you know how to fix it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I explained that to fire. Like if I blinded full, did you right now and said, go get me the saw off the truck, you could do it mm-hmm. because you've practiced that with repetition. And that's my, in my mind, how brain health should work. You guys should have gone over this and over this and over this, that no matter what situation you're put in, you know how to fix this or deal with this with some of the tools you're given. Yeah. yeah and so, no. you know, a lot of people, we joke in therapy, we call them unicorns. I'll tell you right now, I've had a few unicorns in my office. And what do I mean by that? Very rarely does somebody walk in with one single incident that brought them to my office. It's usually one single incident that overfilled their cup, Yeah. but it's yeah. not usually one that does it. It's the little things. And I've had guys walk into my office that have said to me, I went on a call last night with a homeless vet sitting on a park bench crying. And you know what? When I saw him and he was helpless and I couldn't do anything to help him, I just broke down and started crying. I just felt like I can't help anybody. It wasn't some crazy call. It was just that. And so I don't think that it's a good idea to portray portray the idea that it's just one critical incident. You got a trauma trash can and you get (laughs) that one trash can for your year or your career and you got to fill, fill it up. And depending on how quickly you fill it up, it might be three years of service or it might be 30 years, but you only get one to fill up. And then people come into my office because it's full and something dropped in the cup and splashed it all out. Yeah. That makes total, total perfect sense. And that's exactly what you're describing is what, what happened to me. I mean, and you're right. It it may not just be one, one thing. It could be something, so something so minor that just boils somebody over and like, that's it. Um, that's a good example. So what, uh, what's the difference between EMDR therapy, what we just talked about and then brain spotting? Is there, is there a difference? Is it the same type of therapy? I mean, what is brain spotting? So brain spotting was um, kind of derived out of EMDR. So we talked about with EMDR, we move your eyes back and forth. The developer of brain spotting noticed that as we moved your eyes across, that your eyes seemed to wiggle or bounce a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, And this seemed to be directly associated with where the trauma was kind of stored in the brain, down in the midbrain. And so in brain spotting, what we do is same stuff we talked about in EMDR. We talk about what are the feelings in the body? um, What are you kind of experiencing when you think about that incident? And then we find the eye position in the room and we usually look somewhere and we notice that the feelings are more intense. Um, Some of the critique around EMDR is it's too fast, too quick. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, you know, healing very quickly, but sometimes for people, it's a little bit overwhelming. And with EMDR, there's usually a little more clinician involvement. I might ask things like, um, is that what you would say to your kid? Or what would you say to your best friend in this situation? Or imagine that you did chest compressions, then what would happen next? And so there's a little more engagement. EMDR is that kind of engagement process. Brain spotting allows the client to find that spot that holds the trauma, access the feelings, and in their pace, kind of go through what happened. And so it can be slightly slower, but their argument is sometimes that slower is faster. Um, And so with brain spotting, you're traditionally using headphones with the bilateral music. There's no eyes, there's no tapping. Um, And you're holding a fixed gaze in a very mindful state so that the body goes in while you're here and present in this moment being calm and accessing that traumatic material. So again, disturbing material in the brain, yet calm state in the room. And they kind of wire together. Um, They're both very similar. I think the thing that I want all first responders to know is therapists aren't going, and how did that make you feel? Well, and then what did you see? And what was... (laughs) Yeah. What was that leg doing on the train track? We're not yeah. asking that shit. It doesn't matter to us. Everything that you're doing in EMDR and brain spotting is going on inside your head. And every few minutes we check in and ask maybe what you're noticing, but you don't have to go deep into the feelings. You don't have to go deep into the details. And so sometimes this can allow people who maybe have a lot of shame or guilt or embarrassment or just fear of talking to still get the healing that they need by just doing it internally with the therapist kind of guiding them through it. Yeah. And I like that. And you brought up, um, asking a firefighter, Hey, if I blindfolded you and go get this off the truck, you're right. They would be able to go do it without a doubt. Um, it's like, we should be given those tools to help reduce our anxiety or when your heart is starting to elevate your heart rate, starting to elevate, going to a, you know, a hot call, um, giving us those tools to be able to mitigate that, uh, bring that down. And so when you show up to those types of calls, it's only going to benefit everybody because now, you know, the last thing you need is a, is a cop to show up to a, you know, either a, I don't know, critical incident or whatever, something's cracking off and he's at like a 10 already. Right. Um, things aren't going to get, things are not going to get handled properly. Um, sometimes, uh, people are going to overreact, um, because they're so elevated and it just kind of, it jacks everybody up around them and the situation becomes more chaotic Um, and so what I got out of it was going to those calls now being armored with those tools to be able to bring that down for myself. You know, I can show up to stuff like that and really it doesn't even phase me anymore. Um, and I can have that like really calm approach to a high intense call when somebody else might not be. Um, and so I guess being the, the, the calm, calm voice in the, in the chaos, I mean, that, that's Really, that's what I got out of out of it. Well, and, and now that you're a supervisor, I think that that's extremely important because now you are. Well, I mean, when you were canine, you were the same thing, in, in my opinion. Yeah, it's it's often people are going to look towards you, and you you have your own stigma. People know know Kyle and know what he's done and know that he's handle business or whatever it is, and it's important that. You, especially when you, when you have these younger officers that are going to be showing up and they're going to be like, Oh, that there's Kyle, um, that, that you have to be that calm, that rational force or whatever that's there. And, uh, I think that that's important. And, and, um, for me, I think that it's, I'm not in the same boat by any means, but any senior officer or someone who has done some things in their career, there's going to be the younger officers that are going to look towards you. And, and it's very important that you keep your shit together. I basically is is basically what it is, you know, like, and, and that's, and that can be stressful on its own and that can cause its own issues where you're like, Oh, I have to be that guy. Um, you know, I, I can't, I can't break. I can't show my, I, you know, I can't show my heart on the shoulder or whatever it is. Yeah. I've worked with a lot of clients who've come into my office and said, I just can't control this anymore. So it must mean I'm not capable of doing my job because traditionally in law enforcement, you guys are really good at kind of the duck on the water, right? You guys look nice and cool and calm on the top, but sometimes underneath you're paddling really quickly. Um, And when people lose the ability to control that, 
um, they really start to question their abilities. Am I meant to do, do this job? Is something wrong with me? And I worked yeah. with a firefighter one time that his story really impacted me because he said he had never felt career or fear in his career. He had never felt in 17 years the feeling of fear. Mm -hmm. And he was going to put out a fire on a gasoline truck. And as he was pulling the hose to the truck, the driver got out and yelled at him, I'm empty. And he said, I would just kept pulling hose. And I was like, okay. And the guy yelled again, I'm empty. And he said, and I was like, okay. And kept <laughs> walking. And he said, and as I was spraying the water, it all clicked. The gas truck was empty and it was on fire. He was telling me it's going to explode. And he said in that moment, it was the first time that he ever felt intense fear. And in that moment, he thought, oh, if I'm afraid and I'm putting out a fire, it must mean that I'm too weak to do this job, that I'm not capable of doing it anymore. Man. And yeah, what that's... happens for you guys is your human feelings break through your operational mindset. And when that happens, the assumption on your part is traditionally that then I'm not strong enough to do the job. Instead of learning the tools to help you stay operational or stay calm in those situations and then notice that you can have your human feelings after the incident. Yeah. And that, that's actually a great story. And, and, um, the class that I go around and teach and, and I'll get into how I got started with that, which really started with you. Um, fear is a good thing. And I tell everybody that if you're not feeling fear, that is a natural emotion that you have to, uh, figure out how it's going to work in your favor. Right? So yes, we should be scared. That's a natural feeling that you should have because this shit is scary. And, and anybody that says they're not, or to be honest, uh, they're if someone's, lying. yeah, they're lying. But if, if someone's going to go Maybe through their career, themselves, but I mean, they're definitely lying. It yeah. could be just to themselves, but well, they, to your point yeah. in the story that you just shared, if, if, if someone genuinely went through their career or is going through their career and they do not feel scared, that is extremely dangerous. That's, that's to me. Um, I don't want to use the term reckless because I don't think that would be that person's intention, but if you don't have some level of fear or that, that that's dangerous to me. Um, and you are going to probably get yourself hurt, killed, or you're going to get somebody else killed because that that's just not normal to me. Um, and so I, I, I really push that, you know, one of the things I get asked a lot is, oh, well, weren't you scared or aren't you scared going to this stuff? And I'm like, yeah, I'm fucking scared. Of course I'm scared. I don't want to die. You know, I, I don't want to get seriously hurt, but I do have a job to do and my job is, you know, not, not to run the opposite way. Um, I harness that fear and I use it to my advantage to, to do my job and I use it to be safe about it. Um, and, and that's what I push, right. but man, I, I would tell anybody listening, don't let anybody fucking tell you that you shouldn't be scared. Um, they're an idiot. If someone tells you that they're dumb. Yeah, they, definitely. They're dumb. period point <laughs> blank period. I mean, like there's, there's no other way about saying that. You just, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. If yeah. You and, and if you're in a right. leader, and if you're in a leadership role, I'm not saying show up to something and you're now the leader of whatever's going on and you need to manage that situation and show that you're scared and lose your brains. I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. Um, but as a leader also, I do think that it's important to share with your people that it is okay to be scared and we are going to get through this and using good, whether it's tactics or, um, you know, I don't, I can't relate to a firefighter, but at least for us, you know, I will show up to a scary event and using that fear to your advantage, using good tactics. It's okay to feel like that and, and just do a good job. I think that there's a big difference between being scared and acting scared though. Yeah. Um, well, then, you know, many, many, many times I've been scared. And if you were, especially if you're in that leadership role, I think you kind of, and, and this might be what leads to some problems for some people is you kind of got to be like, okay, I got to, I got to get through this fear and I got to deal with it the way that I deal with it and, you know, move on and get, cause we have a, we have a fucking job to get done. And if we sat there and got scared and sat in the corner and was like, I can't do this cause I'm scared. Then that, there's a whole nother issue. Yeah. That's the whole fight or flight and you know, what we talked about earlier, but, um, anyways, that's, that, that, that is actually kind of a wild story that somebody went 17 years in that type of career, not, not oh, yeah. feeling scared that their whole career. And I mean, that's what I'm saying, potentially going to a call like that where a gas tanker is on fire 
and thinking, eh, whatever, I've done this a hundred times. Like being com- in our job, it's being complacent. And well, we it's muscle memory it. too. You know, it's, it's yeah. like, he's, he's pulling hose. I mean, the, he's doing what he does. That's, you know, you, you're in, you, you know, in our Academy, we're taught a uh, bad guy run. We chase bad guy. I think that uh, we could correlate that to fire. I see fire. I put water on fire yeah. kind of deal. And that's just that, Hey, that's that muscle memory. That's what I do. Um, mm-hmm. You know, that's why us cops were, were kind of dumb. You know, if we see rabbit run, we chase rabbit. You know, that's that's the way I look at it. And it's just, it's that memory, muscle memory. It's like, that's my job. That's what I'm doing. And if you don't listen to those outside sources or whatever, and you, you, whatever it is, you get that, you get that tunnel vision and it locks you in and it's, I got to put out the fire. I got to chase the bad guy. I got to do whatever. And that's when we get into issues that in the end can go bad or if they do go good, then we go back to the situation where we're like, wow, shit, that went, that, that ended up. Okay. I've, I've said that before and you're just like, Oh shit. It's confusing Lucky luck me. with, with good tactics. And they're two different things. Um, really showing up to something like that. And we, we see it a lot. Guys get stressed out. They start rushing things. And it's like, hey, we don't need to rush this. Like, your it's stress gets the best of people. And when you're stressed out, your heart rate's elevated. People start feeling like they need to act now. Um, yes. And you don't take a step That's back. Right. Yeah, stop what you're doing. Take a step back. If you need to be the guy or gal that tells everybody, hey, calm the fuck down. We're gonna take this slowly um, because you're the voice of reason. Then do it because there's not a whole lot of situations in our job where we have to just go. Um, wal- you know, waltzing into something, um, you know, barring some active shooter type scenario. And I'm not even going to get into that because I think we, we've done, we've done such a, um, to me, a shitty job of training act responding to active shooters that guys are getting fucking killed left and right responding to an active shooter. Um, but that, that's, that's a whole nother topic. But what I want to say is, um, you know, how I got started into teaching, my class and now, which now has evolved into, I started a business out of it and traveling across the country, getting to teach other law enforcement officers about what we're talking about. And then, you know, applying tactics and how to respond to a critical incident, things that I've learned over the years. Um, after I went and did my therapy with you, you know, I told my bosses, I, I think I might've been out for about six months and and I said, Hey, I'm, I'm feeling really good. And, and to sit here and say, I was a hundred percent cured. I, I can't, I can't say that. Um, no, there's, there's no one that can say, and that. I think, so, I Melissa, mean, you I mean that's agree? any, any physical or mental injury. I, I think you're, you're never a hundred percent, like a major yeah. one. Right. I no, mean, but I, I tore my Achilles eight, nine years ago and I'm not a hundred percent. I never will be. No. So right. was I, was I a hundred percent cured? No, I wasn't. And I, and I actually vividly remember having conversations with you. Um, and I'll admit it to this day that loud noises, unexpected loud noises scare the shit out of me and all my yep. friends know it. Yeah. All my friends know it. Um, That's right. You know, they know I get spooked by it and I'll be on calls and a car will backfire and I'll fucking flinch. You know, I I don't care. I'm, it is what it is. I can't control it. But um, I do remember one time in your office, we were trying to work on that. And I don't know if you remember, but you threw the fucking clock at the wall and whacked me in the head or the timer or whatever. (laughs) And yeah. like, so many people have wanted oh. to throw something at Kyle's head. Oh shit. Sorry about that. You're a legend. Yeah. I'm like, what the hell? No. Uh, so and I usually tell people that, that, um, one, I cannot give you amnesia. I cannot make you not remember the incident. Um, yeah. I can usually take the weight out of it or the distress away from it, but I can't give you amnesia. And that when you leave my office, you're probably going to have a pimp walk. There's going to be something about you that's just a little bit different. And yeah, Kyle, in your case, um, we did what we could around noise and sound. Um, and my throwing the clock on the wall was trying to make a startle <laughs> noise to get that arousal Fire. in his body. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, it's just kind of what the symptoms stayed around for you. And once we have a symptom like that, it's then our job just to kind of do some maintenance on it. Right. So car backfires, you startle, you notice your heart rate kind of goes up. Then you use a coping skill. Okay, I know that I need to ground myself or do a little bit of breathing. And I think for both law and fire, you guys either use rescue breathing or tactile. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you guys call it? Combat breathing. Combat breathing. Combat breathing. Yeah. There you go. Thanks. You guys use those things. And that's a skill that most of you guys walk into my office already having. 
And so having that, that moment that your body starts to kind of betray you and elevate and you can't get it back under control, you do already know some things you can do when you get triggered like that to start to settle yourself back down. Yeah. And, and you brought up coping mechanisms, mechanisms. Why was it so hard to say? Sorry. Cause you're you. Um, what, what about, I know there's a lot of officers and uh, you know, the, they, we all have our different co- long-term coping me- mechanisms. God, I'm having a trouble with that one. Say a different uh, word. You know, skills, um, coping skills. Yeah. So some of us exercise, um, mm-hmm. you know, some of us have family outlets, some of us have hobbies or whatever. It, what is the importance of that? Because I, I, I've seen in, in personal life um, and other people that I've known, it, a lot of times like we go towards alcohol or whatever it may be. And I, I've seen the problems that alcohol can, can, can cause in law enforcement. And I think that it's yeah. important that we, we segue to something else and whether, it, like you said, uh, going towards or like, you know, I, I'm not going to sit here and on my soapbox and say alcoholism, or whatever. Cause because you have a beer, because <laughs> I have a beer in my head. <laughs> but um, you know, it, it can become a problem, and it can yeah. become that that. Oh shit! I had a bad day at work. I'm gonna go home. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna have a beer, two beers, whatever. What you know? What else can we do besides that? Mm-hmm. So all day long, you guys are getting little shots of cortisol and stress, yeah. and you and yeah. I could do two yeah. shots of tequila right now and probably be okay. But when you're working 12 hours or 48 hours on, um, you can't keep drinking that much and not expect to feel the symptoms. And so coping skills are taking a time away from drinking. No more cortisol, no more stress hormone. And so when we're doing things that we like, woodworking or um, my fire guys talk about, they like dropping a tree or maybe it's, um, you know, being in the backyard gardening or cooking dinner. All of these are things that are not causing you to take the shot of the cortisol and adrenaline. And so what you're doing is without alcohol, you're teaching your body how to come back down out of fight or flight. And your body has to learn on its own without alcohol how to regulate that up-down process. Otherwise, you become Mm -hmm. dependent on the alcohol to regulate your mood for you. And so every coping skill that we try to teach you is to give you the power and the access yeah. um, to regulate your own nervous system so that you're not dependent on a secondary mm-hmm. substance. Yeah. I mean, that, that makes, when you put it like that, that, that makes total sense why, you know, people, so many people revert to alcohol because you're right. It does make you, it takes all of that away. And, and then um, next thing you know, it's like, like you said, it's one's not enough, two's not enough, three's not enough. And then now now you've got a, uh, you, now you have a problem. Um, mm-hmm. and then that's going to transcend into, into work and guys start losing their career and, and, um, their families. So I, I think that it, it correlates more to the family life than the career life. I've, I think that we've all known those people that are completely functioning alcoholics or yeah. whatever it may be. And they come to work and they don't drink at work. Um, they're sober at work. They're got their shit together at work but they go home and they drink and it's game on yeah and, and even sometimes they're able to they able to cope with the family life too right. and family adjust or they adjust whatever it is um i just i just see so much harm in using using substances of any any type mm-hmm. because that's always been a fear of of mine or you know not that i've ever gone to any therapy probably need it but um you know, oh, let me let me give you this medication. You know, some people are like, oh, I need the Valium, I need mm-hmm. this, I whatever it is. It's like, no, I, I've seen though. I I see anything that inebriates you or or changes you is is we're basically we're not fixing the the problem. We're fixing the symptoms. Yeah. Right. And so what you're talking about is important, also in terms of I cannot do trauma work with somebody who's using a substance. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. Yeah, I remember you telling me that. That's right. When you're drinking or using a substance, it prevents your brain from actually going into REM sleep. And REM sleep, as you guys know, is your eyes moving back and forth. Mm-hmm. What did I mm-hmm. tell you we do in EMDR? Okay. Yeah, yeah, same thing. And so what happens is when you're in REM sleep, it's actually when your brain processes information and makes new memory networks. And so if you're drinking, you just told your body no processing anything that happened today and no new mm-hmm. memories for you. And so 
if you're drinking, you're also not going to be able to process that information. Sure, you're going to fall asleep quickly, yeah. but you're not actually processing what happened to you. And then whatever work you do in therapy, because you can't make real long term memories, it's actually not going to stick and work. And so mm. people always come to me and they're like, hey, Mel, I wake up at 2 a.m. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you're drinking, huh? And they're like, what? <laughs> How, how'd you yeah. know? What the hell do you think alcohol turns into at 2 a.m.? Yeah. Sugar. A sugar. bunch of sugar. <laughs> and then, boom, bink, you're wide awake at 2 a.m. And right. so people think, oh, it helps me sleep better. Again, short-term gain, long-term pain. Yeah. You're awake at 2 a.m. You didn't process any, process any material. And now you just have a really bad sleep cycle. And for most first responders, they have low T scores, testosterone, because we mm -hmm. replenish testosterone, which helps with mood when we're sleeping. So again, alcohol mm. just compounds all these issues you're already dealing with. Well, and then shift work obviously doesn't yeah. help with that too. No That's wonder right. the firefighters are so girly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just teasing for all you firefighters. Oh, like the firefighters don't get sleep. Yeah. They're it's like... like well, you know, it not depends to go off on, on a, the station. Not to go off on tangents about firefighters, but uh, it is kind of funny when you, you, you get a call, hey, fire's requesting assistance from PD or whatever, and you look at the call, and it's like a 90-year-old dementia <laughs> patient refusing to go to the hospital, and you're like, what the fuck? There's six dudes that work out four hours a day. They can't I'm handle like, this? I'm like, hey, MFers, there's five of you. Yeah. Anyways, yeah, well, we love you guys. Yeah. Um, okay, so... <clears throat> transitioning over to what kind of what I was start, starting to talk about is after I finished my therapy with you and learning all these coping skills that we, we've just talked about, um, it, it really opened my eyes and I was really curious about, um, I don't know if I was curious, but let me just roll into my department. Basically when I came back to work, they said, Hey, can you get in front of our department, share your story? What, uh, share what EMDR is, how it helped you whatever. And at first I was reluctant to do it. Right. Because when I came back to work, I thought I was embarrassed to be honest. I was like, I was out for five or six months. I, I was willing to bet that people thought I was fucked up in the head or, and you look like that. So, I mean, that's yeah, embarrassing. Enough. Exactly. So I was like, man, I'm screwed. Um, so when I came back to work, I really focused on, um, trying to build back broken relationships that I had with people because of issues that I was having. And, I really wanted to prove myself to everybody that, um, that I was back that, and that I was a lot better than when I left. Yes. Um, and I want everybody to know that that is important. You don't, you're not going to go out, get help and then just come back and then, you know, um, expect everybody to just give you back that respect. You are going to have to prove yourself. I also like that you said that you're better. You weren't cured. Cause I, I, I don't think, we'll, well, I already discussed. Yeah. We just talked we about how it didn't ourselves. cure me, but it, yeah. in a hundred percent, but it yeah. definitely for sure helped me and put me in a new position. But, um, ultimately I did agree to do this. Um, and I went up in front of the department. I gave my little spiel about, you know, the issues I was having. I talked about the post-trauma and, you know, doing the EMDR and stuff. And, um, I was a little embarrassed doing it, but what I found so crazy about it was after that, I started getting emails and phone calls and text messages from people in my department that I never have spoken to barely even knew and they were wanting to divulge issues that they were having. And after so many people were doing that, um, I, I kind of became people's little personal therapist, but, um, I was, I, I took a step back and I'm like, Holy shit, there is a lot of people broken and nobody has said anything. And that took me by shock. Um, and so then I started, you know, for every person that reached out to me, I, you know, I obviously got back to them. I, gave them your contact information. I tried to educate them on EMDR therapy and it helped a ton of people. And it started to just spread like wildfire throughout our department. Mm -hmm. So then I was like, wow, there's a lot of people broken in our department. I guarantee, I guarantee you it's across the board everywhere. So, um, that's when I kind of started traveling around and, and doing my little sh classes on, um, p you know, my post-trauma and, um, some of the things I went through. And then I kind of, and then I thought, well, if I'm going to do that, um, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, talk about tactics and how to respond to those types of calls and, and, um, just try to make, you know, uh, share my experiences of those types of things and be involved in it to, to try to make everybody better. Um, not, not to say that my way is the right way, but if you have those experiences, why not share it with everybody else? What went right and what, what went wrong? And so that's kind of what vamped in, into this, what I'm doing now, Yeah. but I found it so so crazy to me that every time I go and do these classes, 
Yeah, everybody loves the stories. They love hearing about all that shit and seeing the videos and, and stuff. And, and that's awesome. But you know, the number one thing I always get asked 10 out of 10 times follow up questions about is what t- share with me more about EMDR therapy, people thanking me for uh, being vulnerable and sharing my story about post trauma and um, how they're going to look into doing EMDR therapy because they're broken. That is the number one thing I get asked all the time. Every time I do a class, I've, I know shit. I've had people across the world email me questions about it. Um, Cause talk therapy doesn't work. It's crazy. Right. And yeah, so I many agree. people go in to talk therapy and think, Oh, if I just talk about it, it's going to help me. And we know that that's not true. Um, and so when people don't know what's out there to help them, they end up suffering a lot more. And mm-hmm. this is, this is an injury. This isn't a weakness. This isn't something that you chose to have, Right. This is some an injury to the nervous system that it could not process that amount of information. And so it got stuck. And so when you have an injury like that, you need to know what kind of, you know, quote, medicine to fix that correct injury. And if you're not treating it with the right stuff, of course, you felt like you, you're not going to get better. Of course, you're feeling hopeless, like, fuck, I'm stuck like this, you know, and when you mm-hmm. get hopeless, that's where we start to see suicide. And so yeah. you're, you're going to see that if you don't know what EMDR is or brain spotting or just kind of trauma work in general. Who, who needs EMDR or who needs therapy? Is it, is it important to get it before it's a problem or is it, do we, cause in law question. enforcement, I think that most of us, and I will say me included are going to wait until it becomes a problem and whatever <laughs> yeah. that problem is, whether it's a home life a work life, whatever. We're going to wait for that problem. Is it advantageous for us to seek it? I, because the the question is always going to be: Is oh, have you and have you experienced trauma in your career? Mm-hmm. If you've, I think that in my in the academy, I probably had yep. trauma. That's you know, some of the going on. We're, we're we've had the trauma. So, right. do I need EMDR? Do I need therapy? Do I need whatever works for me? So there's a couple of easy rules. And I have to say, Billy, you're right that so many people experience trauma on probation, but you can't talk about it, right? right. Or yeah. um, when, no. You're, no. when you're an F, an FTO and things like that. And so there's a lot of people who actually have very early on trauma from their career because that's the biggest time where you sure as fuck better not talk about it, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and so the difference is that in your brain, things move from short-term memory over into long-term memory. It's mm-hmm. much, much easier for me to go in with EMDR but some, before something has actually solidified and really made a, a tight network of um, neurons in your brain in the first three months. That's so much easier for me to go in and get a better result versus you're like, hey, I got like this 27-year-old memory. By all means, we're going to get you some relief and we're going to get you results. But when you come in earlier, it hasn't had time to really congeal in your brain. It's still a little bit more flexible. And so if you sure. come in within that first three months, we're going to be able to help you a lot quicker, a lot faster without all that fallout symptoms. So, so it's, it's cancer-esque, I would say. Yeah, you know, I that, like that. That's a way that I would, if you let cancer grow, it's, it's going to fucking kill you, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But if and we so, get it right off the top, then. Good analogy. Okay. And I think that what you see is that, you know, you guys kind of talk about this, that the culture is, I'm fine. I got it. This will pass. It'll go away. But you should know that you need to come into therapy when it's been more than three months and it's not going away, right? Yeah. And so you can often talk about a shitty call. A lot of people come in my office and they're like, Mel, I've had a lot of really bad incidents, right? Um, Yeah, we went on, um, you know, a call and there was a dead baby in the swimming pool floating. And that was awful. But I don't know. I don't have kids. So it really doesn't bug me. I don't really think about that. But... um, You know, I went on a different call, you know, 12 years ago where somebody burned alive in the car and I, and I had to listen to them scream why they died. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and fire took a long time to get on scene and that really just upset me and made me angry. Um, Mm -hmm. and when I think about that 12 year old call, all those feelings of that night come back. I feel helpless. I feel angry. I feel that same. I can't do anything. See the stuck here again. I couldn't act. Um, and so I have all that. And what people will start to experience is the distress in their body starts to come back. We can talk a lot, a lot about shitty calls all night long, 
and we don't feel them again in our body. But when you're talking about something that happened, no matter how old it is, and you feel it in your body, my guys will say things like, it grabs me by the throat, or it's a pit in my stomach. Um, then that means it's stuck. That feeling is stuck in the body and it has not moved and processed. And with EMDR and brain spotting, we look for something called neutral or nothing. So when you think about the shooting that night, what do you feel in your body? I don't know, neutral, numb, nothing. Okay, yeah. when you think about that incident with the person in the vehicle, what do you think about? Yeah, I mean, that shit fucking sucked, but no, nah, I don't really feel anything anymore. Yeah. And so yeah, if you're still funny. having feelings, you got to come in. Let us get that out of your cup because you're going to add more stuff in there. So yeah. let's oh, make yeah. some more room for the things that are coming. Yeah, right. that, that's important. And, and I think for if you're an FTO or a field training officer listening to this or or even a supervisor, um, know that it, it is important to have these conversations, I think, with your trainee, mm -hmm. especially after something bad has happened, especially if these, these young kids are coming into this job and we're seeing more and more of that now. No life experience. You know, they're, they're young, um, which is how I started, but having those conversations with them after something happened, like, Hey, sit down with them. Hey, how'd that make you feel? Um, you know, you don't have to be such a hard ass all the time and expect a trainee to be a robot. Right. They are going to internalize that. That was probably whatever happened may have been the most traumatizing thing they have ever seen in their entire life. I'm willing to bet that that's probably true. Right. And, you know, being in a, in, in a, as a field training officer, you, you are in a leadership role. And, and part of leadership is to check in on your people, make sure that they're okay. You know, put the tough guy um, um, aside and have that conversation with them, make sure that they're okay. I mean, I, I see nothing wrong with that. You're only going to benefit that person. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think those conversations are being had. But those are really good conversations to be had while you're driving around in a patrol car, especially after maybe you just were involved in something. Yeah. We all have so much downtime. I mean, driving around. Yeah. If you're, you know, we all know that if you work with a partner, you're going to sit there and you're going to you're going to talk to that partner about some. Well, I would encourage that. shit. But I would encourage a training officer to have those talks with. The same, yeah. yeah. Hey, man, um, you know, like, let's talk about it. How did it make you feel? Um Hey, you know, that actually scared the shit out of me. And the gun story I told you about the guy that pulled the gun on me, we didn't shoot him. I was on FTO at the time. My FCO did ask me that. And I did tell him, you know, that, yeah, like that, that was, uh, it was a different experience for me. It did, it did scare me. Um, I think that's totally acceptable to have those conversations and you're probably going to make yourself better, but you're also going to make that person better. And we yeah. need to start being better about that. And I think too, to that same point that, um, a lot of people come to therapy and they're like, you know, whether it's partners writing together or a fire crew, how come I'm the only one that this fucked up? It didn't fuck up my mm -hmm. partner, yeah. right? Or yeah, the other right. two uh -huh. guys on my crew were fine. Why am I fucked up? What's wrong with mm -hmm. me that it got me? And something to know is that what's traumatic to you may not be traumatic to me and vice versa. And so sure. just because you ch check in with somebody and they say, nah, man, I'm fine. That doesn't necessarily mean that other people are okay. And so we're all going to experience the trauma differently. It, we're all going to have a different perspective of it. And knowing that it's okay to start putting words to things like, hey, you know, that didn't get to me, but that doesn't mean it's not going to get to you. Yeah. And the reason behind that is we all have different childhood experiences. Mm -hmm. And we know that when we have a childhood experience that mimics something that we go through in our career, it can often be more detrimental. And so yeah. a good example of that is if you grew up like in a home where there was maybe DV or kind of just dysfunctional family members and your parents fought a lot, but your coping skill was to go hide. Mm -hmm. When a critical incident goes down, you're going to default back to that old setting of maybe cowering, hiding or pulling back versus somebody who lived in a DV home, but their response was to go fight their drunk alcoholic father mm -hmm. in the same kind of critical incident. They're going to be the one that moves into fight or flight as a default or fight as a mm -hmm. default. And That's so crazy. notice, same situation, same maybe OIS, but the two people in their experiences and backgrounds are going to shape their response differently. Mm -hmm. And again, then their view of themselves. And so knowing that we're not going to all experience the same call the same way and giving everybody permission that, sure, it might just fuck up one person and not the other. And that's okay. It doesn't have to yeah. fuck up everyone so, to count as a fucked up call. Yeah. And, and that's interesting that you bring that up because I, I grew up in a law enforcement family and my dad uh, was a cop for many years and he, he never brought up to me when I was younger because I was younger and, and that's not something that you talk to your kid about. 
But um, when I got older and got into law enforcement, he talked to me about some of the issues that um, he'd experienced and everything. And I, I think that one time he, he told me, he's like, I remember going to a call and I don't think the the child died or anything, but I the child was injured and it, the child could have died. It, it's, it doesn't matter either way. But he remembers that the child was the same age as me. Yeah. Or my sister or whatever. Yeah. And he was sitting there and he had to call my mom in the middle of the night. And he called my mom and was like, hey, uh, just call it how the kids. And my mom, you know, not, you know, not realizing anything. Uh, yeah, they're fine. You know, everything's okay. And that's all it took. Mm -hmm. But uh, we all have our own experiences and our own things that we take from our personal life. That's right. That, uh, that, that come into our career. Right. Yeah. yeah, that that is important. Um, I just think a lot of people in our profession fail to realize that they get in this very robotic mode at work, and the, the, it's almost like the the human aspect of it goes out the window. Mm -hmm. And we need to start bringing that back. Um, I think you'll start seeing less use of forces, um, guys making bad decisions, <clears throat> or gals. But yeah, it just seems like uh, you know in our profession the whole human aspect of it completely goes out the window and we become robots at work and that's how you're expected to perform. And, you know, I just, I don't agree with it. And, and I've experienced bad things in my career and I know you have, and a lot of people have, I, I would venture to say if you're in, in a first responder doing whatever it is you're doing, doctor, nurse, um, EMT, paramedic, firefighter, cop, I don't care. Military. Military. You, yeah. You're going to, you're going to um, experience a lot of bad shit in this, in your job and um, dispatchers and dispatchers for yeah. sure. But, um, you know, it's up to us to take care of ourselves. We got to be open, more open about this type of stuff and start educating folks on how to seek treatment before it turns spirals. You know, it, what I always find sad too is a lot of times in our jobs, we work with these old salty veteran type guys we talked about in the first episode. And, um, I always think like some of them were real bitter. They hated their, their job. They, you know, you know, they're alcoholics outside of work. They smoke, they're out of shape, right? They're just, they've been doing this job for 20 plus years and they're still a road cop that are a patrol cop, right? And um, I think as a younger cop, I always wrote them off as just, well, they sucked. They were a dickhead. They sucked at their job. They were never were promotable. And I kind of wrote them off. And even though, Billy, I know you talked about like, yeah, there's no, you can get nuggets from those, those types of cops uh, that can teach you stuff. And, and I do agree with you on that. Mm -hmm. um, but after going through Melissa's EMDR therapy, um, and then doing this, these classes that I started teaching, like I really started to think those, those guys that, that were like that, I wonder if they were ever salvageable. Um, and I'm, I'm venturing to guess they became like that because they, they had issues and they never got help and they just let themselves spiral and the department never recognized it. And they just, and they let them spiral. I mean, we're all salvageable no matter what. I think even those guys that have, and correct me if I'm wrong, done 30 years of whatever. And sometimes they choose to do that and uh, that's fine. Um, because like you said, they, they like to do that. They, maybe they like to be a patrol cop. They don't want to promote and be, and be in a leadership role. And, and I'm okay with that. But I think that there is a lot of guys that end their career and honestly got dealt a bad hand with just never being educated on dealing with this type of shit. And now they have to live their entire life and they went their whole career being fucked up and nobody helped them. And, 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 know, and that's not, I, that's not all one sided. There's, there's the officers that we all know that, that seek nothing in their sure. career. And they all of a sudden I, say you do 20 years and everyone around you has been around shit, but you've been lazy your whole fucking career. And then all of a sudden something happens. Yeah. That's going to be more traumatic to you. But yeah, um, yeah not to go ahead. What go were you ahead. Say, I'm Lisa? sorry. I just want to talk a little shit. I think that sometimes, um, you know, those old salties that we see are sometimes some of my most profound clients um, because they come in and they think they're stuck that way. I've been this way mm -hmm. for fucking 20 years, right? Bitter yeah. and old and cynical. Um, yeah. And yet it's just a call that was so traumatic that really that they've just shut down everything. I'm not going to socialize anymore. I hate yeah. people and the world. And yet they deal with these calls and that's some of the most profound change. You know, because they've been living with that for so long. And yeah, I wonder to Kyle's point, you know, how could their life have been different if they had sought help earlier? Yeah, well, I don't know. We'll, we'll never know unless, you know, 
Sometimes it's too late for me. I've worked with guys that retired and then ended up dying. Absolutely. Out of poor health and, you know, whatever. So anyways, um, yeah. So, I mean, after, um, that, that, like, that's how I got started into doing what I'm doing is it started with this. It started with opening up, being vulnerable. And now, you know, I, 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 I mean, that's a big word for, there. Vulnerable. That's, that's hard for me. For, it's a big word. Yeah. It, it's hard for us in law enforcement to say, Hey, I, I got to be vulnerable. Cause that's what it takes. Yeah. Well, part of leadership is um huge part of leadership is trust and not to go on a tangent about leadership. Cause we could talk about it for a week and probably not even scratch the surface, but you know, part of leadership is trust I, that to me, that's the foundation of being a good leader. And to be a good leader, you do have to be vulnerable. Um, because when you're vulnerable, just like I experienced getting up in front of my department and telling them my, my issues, um, all those people that reached out to me that I didn't know that, that tells me that they now trust me. And so you have to allow yourself to be vulnerable for people to trust you, to build that foundation, to be a better person and and to be a good leader. So if you're in a leadership role and you haven't allowed yourself to do that, people aren't going to trust you and you're probably not, you're not thriving in your, your role as a leader. Um, You may not recognize it, but if you're listening to what I'm saying, you're not thriving because people aren't trusting you. So you need to take a step back and be willing to be vulnerable and, and allow people to trust you. That is so important to me. I can't stress that enough. Um, so anyways, that's kind of what transitioned me into, like I told you doing, doing what I'm doing. And I mean, for, for God's sake, we're on a podcast talking to hundreds or thousands of people being vulnerable or two. <laughs> yeah, probably like two. <laughs> um, no, but seriously, I, I, I can't tell you how important it is. Um, I, I think we just need to start changing the culture of our profession and not just with us, but fire and, you know, medics and all that. Um, I, I think we're doing a good job we're getting that of, way. We're going that way. starting We're we're yeah. starting the conversation. And I think that I, I can, I can only think of my department because I don't work for your department. I don't work for all you out there's department. So I don't know. Um, but I, I know that there are options out there. Yeah. There's people you can talk to. There's people you can talk to within your department. There's people you can talk to outside your department. Uh, it, it, you can talk to us. I mean, uh, yeah. if, if it's an issue, if you have an issue, if you need help or whatever, and you just don't want to be, you just want to be John Smith or whatever, who wants to talk to either one of us. who knows something and me who knows nothing. Hey, mm-hmm. Hey, shoot out yeah. and, you know, uh, reach out to us and, and maybe we can help you or, or push you in the right direction. But seeking the help, I think, is the most important thing. Absolutely. I, I agree with you. Um, and if you have the ability to spread the word in your department or wherever you work about this type of stuff, um, start doing that. Start doing your research on EMDR if you're feeling like you need to go to seek out a, an EMDR therapist. And like Melissa said earlier, it has to be somebody that you connect with. Um, go do that. Bring that back to your department. And be that person that starts the, uh, the process. If you, if you don't already have it started. Yeah. If, if you, if you seek it and it helps, do not be afraid to tell people say, Hey, this yeah. is what I did. Like Kyle, this is what I did. He's put out a podcast for potentially millions. Yeah. Right. <laughs> millions to listen to, but, um, you know, that's just what it is. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Hold on. Close this out. Okay, um, so Melissa. Oh, go ahead, Melissa. How how if if I wanted help, if I needed to get in contact with you, how do I get? Do I just type in Melissa Freitas and or your just name EMDR, comes up, yeah. or EMDR or um, cops that need help, whatever it is? Um, how do we how do we look for it and how do we find it? The help. So I, I think a couple good resources um, are websites like FireStrong. Um, And even though that sounds like it's a firefighter website, it's actually a wonderful website that you can go in there and look at different um, agencies or states and then go under there. And they have under each state um, different departments listed out with what are their resources. And so going Mm -hmm. on that website and seeing the resources that are available kind of all over. And then here in California, we have one of the best retreats in all of the United States. And it's called um, FRSN, the First Responder Network. Um, And if you go to the FRSN webpage um, and you go under resources, it'll say clinicians. 
And it's broken down by all the different counties in California. And you'll see all the clinicians that are not only first responder certified, but they're going to have EMDR and brain spotting. And we're all culturally competent. And so no matter where you are in the state of California, go on there under resources, find a clinician in your area and call them. Um, finding a resource around you is probably going to take a little bit of legwork. Don't just stop with your EAP. Um, get online, type in first responders and therapy. There's going to be some people around you that pop up and call them. Um, mm -hmm. The goal is to try to find somebody that we've talked about that you're going to click with and get those resources. Um, there's other national hotlines and things like that that you can also reach out to. Um, but I think that kind of knowing that here in the California, we have those um, that can help us is really important. Yeah, that's awesome. And we'll put all the uh, websites that you just mentioned in our in the description of our uh, podcast notes and on YouTube. We'll put it in the Hashtag description. Them or something. Yeah, I, I just want to do well, that. Well, on most YouTube videos, they're like, while. we'll put them in the links below and do some crazy. Yeah. Hashtag. Anyways, uh, whatever. We'll put all the description and the links um, and on then, those websites. And then you brought it up and I just wanted it reiterate it that it the first person you reach out to might not be for you okay? yeah it didn't work for you um and yeah. no offense to melissa melissa might not be for you and absolutely and i hope i hope that if it, you would give her a chance and if you don't and it doesn't work out it doesn't work out move on seek something else if you need help get help yeah and do you All have right. anything to add to that um all no, i can I mean, say I think... is um go ahead that's a good point, right? Um, that I am not the right response or the right therapist for everybody. Just because I was a good fit for Kyle doesn't mean that I'm a good fit for Billy. Um, and that just because somebody that you're being referred to says, hey, this clinician was great for me, that doesn't th mean they're going to be great for you. And if they're not great for you, that shouldn't be the end of your search. Everybody has a different palette. Everybody's going to like a different therapist. Um, mm -hmm. And your insurance will actually allow you to see multiple therapists at the same time while you're figuring out. It will be covered. Um, so don't be afraid like, oh, no, my insurance isn't going to cover me if I switch because I already started with somebody else. That's not true. Okay. Yeah, that's good to know. I mean, um, if you guys, uh, anybody listening to this, you know, you're feeling like some of this is uh, resonating with you a little bit. And I, I think this is, if you're a first responder, this should be resonating with you yeah. to a certain extent, no matter what. Um, I would start, so, start seeking this out. Um, if you're feeling like you were unsure of what direction you wanted to go, whether you wanted to go seek help or if you didn't, I mean, hopefully listening to this has guided you in that direction. Um, I would say do it. Um, it's only gonna, it's only gonna help you. And then and in return, you're only going to be able to help other people along the way. And we need to start, we really need to start getting this out there more and more and more. And the more we talk about it, the more we educate people on it by doing what we're doing. Um, then, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it every day of the week if that's what we need to do. So, um, <clears throat> we'll wrap this up. Um, I can't thank you enough, Melissa, for taking time out of your day for doing yeah. this. Um, hopefully this has touched a lot of people and if it has share it with your friends, share it with your bosses, uh, share it with people you work with. Um, you know, sometimes one person can be, can be the voice, um, of a change within a whole organization. Um, and that, if that's what this does for you, then, then I'm, then I'm stoked. Yeah. If, if this helps one person out, um, we're happy. I, I, I'm going to pat Kyle on the back. Yeah. So anyways, thank you Great everybody job, for, yeah. Thanks for tuning in everybody. Oh. Hopefully, um, you now have a good understanding of what EMDR is and at least what direction to go. I mean, we could talk about it for hours probably, but, it gives you a general idea of what it is, what direction to go and how to start bettering ourselves and other people around us in our profession um, to, to stay healthy through your whole career. So, and I, I had one question that I just want to, I know that I'm going off no, topic go ahead. here or whatever. Go ahead. So what about significant others in our career? Um, should, should spouses be seeking some sort of EMDR or something? Can, can, can EMDR help them? Or Absolutely. The poor spouses just don't get talked about enough, right? They really right. take the brunt of this with the behavioral change of their partner, um, all the different ways that the job affects them. And then this stuff starts to come home and seep into their life and the ability to have fun and connect. Um, and in some sense, they get their own kind of 
PTSD in some sense from this, mm-hmm. right? They lose the ability right. to trust. They lose hope. They become fearful and anxious. When's the next time you're going to throw the coffee cup um, or get drunk? Um, you know, what happens if you just keep picking up more and more and more overtime shifts to deal with the stress because you just don't know how to come out of fight or flight. So it's just work more. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they end up being the poor victims in the background that don't ever get to tell their story and what happened to them. Mm -hmm. And so it is important that they reach out and they get their own help. Um, that, you know, at the first responder network, we actually have a program called SOS. Um, and it's just for spouses and significant others um, to come out and deal with their trauma of what happened to them um, through this whole process and getting support of like, how do I actually help my loved one? How do I actually guide them in the right direction? What is best? Um, and letting them have support and knowledge because they also probably don't understand what's going on in my person's head. They used to come home and be talking and laughing and now they come home and turn on the TV and they don't even engage with me. They need their own support to understand what's going on. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. That was, that's a good point. I'm glad you actually brought that up. Um, that there is assistance for them too, so that they're educated to know what we're going through. Yeah. Um. So, yeah. I, I think it's important as a first responder to realize that the trauma that you go that you may go through, or the simple fact that you're leaving the house and your spouse knows what you do, um, that that there's gonna be a stress there. There's there they don't know that. There, there's plenty of times that they're like, they've thought through their minds that there's no guarantee my significant other is coming home tonight, mm-hmm. and and that's a that's a stress that they deal with every single day you leave the house, and yeah. and it's been as simple as my wife will text me or something, and I'm in the middle of a call or something, and I'm like, I'll deal with that later. That simple trauma of not knowing, oh shit, what happened. Um, or there's an OIS or there's something like that that get very public very quick. Yeah. And I think it's very important. Me personally, when I do, I just send out something to my wife. I'm okay. Talk to you later. Yeah, I know that's good. Good, solid points. Um, anyway, so thanks for that. All right. Well, if you guys have questions, you can always hop on over to my Instagram. Um, you know, Kyle underscore Schoberg can ask questions for Billy or I. If you want me to ask questions for Melissa, I can reach out to her. Anybody's free to get a hold of me through my Instagram. I can, uh, if you want to filter it through me to get to reach a hold of Billy or Melissa, feel free to do that. And then you can always check out my website, you know, kyleshoberg.com and, and um, the, the classes that I offer for training. Um, so that wraps it up for this. Again, Melissa, thank you. Yes, um, thank you very much. I mean, absolutely, I guys. Something. Anything for you guys. I absolutely appreciate it. So, that wraps up today tonight's episode and hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.